So does it really matter what Bible version you choose? So I wasn't always a King James Bible believer. This is my NIV. I got this because it's what the pastor of the church was preaching from at the time. Uh, I wasn't brought up in any King James Bible churches. I vividly remember laughing off the idea that there was anything fundamentally wrong with my NIV when I first heard about the Bible version controversy. There were a lot of things that eventually changed my mind about Bible versions, but I think one of the first objections that I had to the whole idea was that it really didn't matter. I mean, after all, they're just versions. It's just a preference, really. I mean, and probably the newer ones were better, easier to understand based on better manuscripts. Uh, and really, all you had to do was avoid this one. This is the New World Translation from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Just avoid that and you'll be okay, right? Here's James White's book. It's called The King James Only Controversy. Can you trust the modern translations where he tears down the King James Bible and says that they're all okay? And on page five, he basically says what I used to think. I'm going to read this aloud, but I'm a little ashamed of this because this is what I used to think. Well, here goes. The use of a particular English translation of the Bible is surely a personal choice. Many factors can and should go into your decisions as you purchase Bible translations. Whether you like a more literal, formal translation or a more dynamic, free-flowing translation will impact your choices. Study editions, companion volumes, concordances, and even print style and size are all issues to take into consideration. So is this really true? Is the text of the Bible really no more important than the font that it's printed in? Is this just a personal preference? Well, this can only be true if all of the Bible versions really have the same message. If they're all saying the same thing, then we can really just pick and choose whatever, whatever makes us feel good is a good choice. Well, we should test that. In Acts chapter 8, the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go to this Ethiopian eunuch to preach the gospel to him, and the eunuch gets baptized on the spot. So here's what it says in the NIV. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Did you notice that in the NIV it just jumps from verse 36 to verse 38? Here's what it says in the King James Bible. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So do these books really teach the same thing? In the NIV, Philip treats the Ethiopian eunuch's question as a rhetorical question and never gives him an answer, and he just gets baptized. If you're reading through the NIV, there's nothing that hinders a baby from being baptized, for example. There's no hindrance. In the King James, it's very clear. Philip tells him that he has to believe in his heart. And then this Ethiopian eunuch makes a verbal confession before he's baptized. Let me ask you this. If you go to a Baptist or an evangelical church that won't baptize babies, can they give you a clear scriptural reason for that? Or is it just church tradition? Is your final authority on infant baptism the tradition of your church, or do you have a clear scriptural support for saying, we don't baptize babies? Now, I don't want to get off topic. This video is really just about the fact that there are significant differences between the Bible versions, but this is a good place to point out something. In the NIV on this verse, it has a footnote that says, some late manuscripts have this verse, the one that they left out and they include it in the footnote. What the footnote doesn't say is that some late manuscripts means over 25 of the manuscripts we have with this passage on them do contain the verse. What it also doesn't say is that Irenaeus cited it in 202 AD and Cyprian cited it in 258 AD. And this is what I started finding out when I would get into these verses. The footnotes don't tell you the reasons why these verses have been changed. In fact, they give you misleading information like that. I mean, in this case, you've got a verse with tons of evidence that shows that this that it existed in the third century, and the critical text scholars pull it out and say, no, 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 
This, this didn't show up until the 6th century. It's just not true. Well, let's get back on track here. The question I'm really answering here is if it even matters which Bible version you choose. Is there anything different about them? Well, let me frame the question for you a little bit differently. Would it matter to you if your pastor got up this Sunday and said, Church, I've decided that Jesus Christ really isn't God. He had a creation, so therefore he can't be God. Does that matter? Well, I sure hope so. Well, if that matters, does it matter if your Bible says the same thing? What if your Bible says this in Micah 5 verse 2, in a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ? Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Huh. There's your NIV saying the same thing that pastor just said. Christ had an origin, and that origin was in ancient times. Well, what if you had, instead of picking an NIV, you picked a King James Bible? Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Well, the NIV says that Jesus Christ had an origin in ancient times. The King James Bible says from everlasting. Would you go to a church that taught that Jesus Christ is a created being, that he's not God? Well, I would hope not, but you're okay with a Bible that teaches this? Are you sure it doesn't matter which Bible version you choose? Well, it even gets worse. Not only does the King James completely refute this heresy in the book of Micah, it also plainly states who Jesus Christ was. 1 Timothy 3.16 in the King James And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. See, no question about it. God was manifest in the flesh. Well, what if you wanted to take your NIV and show this verse to the pastor? He appeared in a body. Oops, your NIV just says, he appeared in a body. Well, nobody disputes that Jesus Christ appeared in a body. The Jehovah's Witness believes Jesus appeared in a body. Their fake Bible translation reads just like the NIV, and they have no problem proving with this text that Jesus Christ is not God. Do you still want to say it doesn't really matter which Bible version you choose and that they all have the same message in them? If I keep showing you verses like this, the video will go on for hours. There are thousands and thousands of verses like this where there are substantive, meaningful differences between the different versions. If you want to see more, go to av1611.com and check out the various charts of verses there. Now I'm going to say something that to me is obvious, but that somebody out there is going to say I don't understand. Me showing you these verses and their differences does not automatically prove that King James is correct. I know that. But pay attention to what it is that I'm proving to you. These translations are not consistent authorities. And when you pick and choose a translation, you're making your own mind your final authority. Or perhaps your church, your pastor, or a scholar you trust. You know, a guy like James White, maybe he can tell you. So you have a choice to make. You can continue to pretend that all these Bibles have the same message and they say the same thing, even though they clearly don't, or you can come to terms with the fact that they don't. What's more, if you claim that you get your doctrine out of the Bible, well, you've got a problem there. If you're going to be honest about it, you've got to say which one. Are you going to try to get around the problem by saying the original Greek and Hebrew is your final authority? Well, that's convenient since there is no original Greek and Hebrew left. All we've got are copies of copies of copies, and the scholars can't agree on which ones are the best anyway. But that's okay, because nobody can ever pin you down on it now, and your final authority is now subject to revision and new discovery. When I was still using my NIV, this is actually what got me started studying the topic of Bible versions. After comparing verses between these different Bible versions, I couldn't lie to myself and say these are all the same thing, that they all mean the same thing. For me, the next step was to learn the reasons for all of these differences. I kind of touched on that with that footnote thing, but at the end of the 19th century, there was a sea change in Christian academia that basically threw out the Bible of the Reformation. Well, by now you should be wondering, if you're being honest with yourself, why would so-called conservative Christians and churches embrace a book like this that says Jesus Christ has an origin in ancient times? Some people say it's crazy to say that this book is God's word, but that this book isn't. 
But you know what's really crazy? This book says that Jesus Christ is from everlasting. This book says that Jesus Christ's origins are from ancient times. What's crazy is saying that these can both be God's word. If you're not going to take a stand and risk someone calling you a cultist because you've got a tangible in your hand book when you say God's word is my final authority, at least be honest. Don't say they're both God's word. Say neither one of them are and admit it. Your mind is your final authority. You decide whenever you come to a verse what God is saying. You don't subject yourself to something. Look, if you've been using an NIV for years, or an ESV, or a New American Standard, or whatever, I know it's tough to consider the possibility that they're full of corruptions. Well, I was there. I used to believe and study this. Look, I even wrote all kinds of notes. This is my old NIV. But you know what? The emotions I have that caused me to have fondness for this NIV don't trump the facts. Remember this book, James White's book? Well, let's look at this again. Look at this heading, The Role of Christian Freedom. Well, here he sets the tone. For James White and for worldly Christianity, this is about freedom. It's about what you want. It's about how you feel. It's not necessarily about God's Word. It's all about you. Here he says that for King James Bible believers, this is not an issue of freedom, but of doctrine, belief, and faith. Well, what else is it about? Where do we get our doctrine, if not the Bible? Where do you learn that Jesus Christ is God and that he's not a created being, if you don't learn that from the Bible? Is it all tradition? And belief and faith, how do you know what you're supposed to believe or what your faith is if you don't get it out of the Bible? A huge portion of this book is dedicated to pulling down the King James Bible, to convincing you that it's filled with errors, and why would you do that? Well, he has to, because if he's going to make the argument that any Bible is an okay Bible to pick, you can't have one standing above all of the others. You can't, you're not allowed to pick one and say, this is my final authority. So what about the role of Christian freedom, as James White titles it? Do I really believe, as a King James Bible believer, that this isn't about freedom? Well, what does the Bible say? John 8.32 And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Make you free. Not set you free. There's a huge difference. Make you free. Well, this is about freedom. The truth makes you free. James White believes that you can be free to choose your truth. That somehow your freedom in Christ comes before figuring out what the truth is. It's the other way around. The truth makes you free. Let's stop putting the cart before the horse here. When you no longer have to look to scholars like James White or the tradition of your church to figure out what it is that God said or have somebody t tell you what they think was in the originals, whatever. When you can go straight to the source and you know what God said, that's true freedom.